Okay, so the session today is entitled Murphy versus Krugman. You can see the way I've set up this PowerPoint, the importance of framing effects. Um, this, uh, you, you guys, I'm betting, how many of you think this is Photoshopped? No. Oh, okay, well, this guy does. All right, it's not Photoshopped. That's really me. Those are not really my muscles, though, just to be clear. So this was my Halloween costume. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, the, there is a... a, a, a Feud, perhaps you could say. There's a reason that uh, people associate me versus Krugman. Uh, Tom Wood saw an entrepreneurial opportunity and tried to latch onto my wagon as I was going up. So this is um, th th this is uh, in, for, for in case you don't know. Let me just give a, a plug for the the podcast. So Tom and I had this podcast contra Krugman. Let me say it, it was his idea. He he called me up originally, and, and I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. We're going to be just you know pigeonholed. And the more he talked about it, I said, oh, yeah, we got to do this, Tom. This is going to be great. And so what it is, is every week we take one of Krugman's op-ed columns, and we go through and, and dissect it. And the, the point is to entertain, but also to teach Austrian economics and, and show the flaws in, in Keynesian analysis. So let me just say um, some words about that for a minute, because some people, we, we get various types of criticism. Some people say, you know, what do you do when you're giving this guy a platform? And it's kind of like, well, I think the New York Times already did that. And, you know, he won the whole Nobel thing, you know, if, you, if you're into that stuff. So uh, it, for better or worse, a lot of people in this room would say for worse, Krugman has this platform and he is the voice of sort of snarky Keynesian economics. So Tom and I said, why couldn't we be the voice of snarky Austrian economics, right? And so, um, so we, what we do is we critique his column, but it's Having said that, I really do want to stress that a lot of people will say, oh my gosh, Krugman's such an idiot, he's a moron. He, he's not, all right? And it's important to realize that like, people times, a lot of times ask us whether we're talking about Krugman or Ben Bernanke or people of that nature, and they say, are these guys just stupid or are they evil? And I always, I'm very polite, and I just say, well, they're not stupid, and I just leave it like that, all right? So, <laughs> all right, so... Uh, as, as far as, let me just mention, since I brought that topic up, I think the way Krugman uh, analyzes these things, the way he goes to sleep at night, I don't think in his mind he's consciously lying about stuff. I think to him this is a big game, and he knows these economic models, you can have any result you want pop out because he's, he knows how arbitrary it is. He's very clever. He can produce different results depending on what he needs the, the answer to be. So that's something I'm going to hit on it a little bit later uh, but I, I want to say that officially up front that I, that's really the problem I have with Krugman. And you'll notice that if you listen to the podcast, I make this point frequently. It's not so much in any particular argument that what Krugman is saying and the assumptions he's making to get that result is that particularly crazy. I mean, as an Austrian economist, you'd say it's not good economics. The methodology is bad and you know the, the type of model he's building is, is not good. But the assumptions he picks and the, the things he's going to include in the analysis and the stuff he says, we can safely leave this aside for right now those things change week to week. But the thing that's always the same is that there's a role for bigger government, and in particular, there's a role for Hillary Clinton's bigger government. All right, And so that's partly why also he he's, you know, vexes us so much, is it's not even like he's an ideologue so much as he's a partisan, that he actually like really likes... It's not even just he's a, he's a Democrat with a capital D, but a Hillary Clinton Democrat, so it's particularly uh, annoying in that respect. So that's uh, that's the point of the podcast, and... It's funny, like I said, we get criticism from both sides. When we started out and some people were telling us, you guys are being too nice, I, I think the guy would be okay. I'm not, I don't even know the guy's name to, to repeat it, but he said something like, you guys are just treating it like he's making honest intellectual mistakes when it's like this guy has, has defrauded my uncle or something, and I really want you guys to you know, stick it to him. And then other people, though, say, hey, I try to share this with my friends who like Keynesian economics, who like Paul Krugman, and they say you guys are too snarky. So we do, we do face those, those traps. You can't make everybody happy, so fortunately Tom and I have fun, and if you guys want to listen, go ahead. So now here's another thing. Now this is not an actual photo. This was not my previous Halloween costume. Let me explain. This was actually in The Economist, so let me just give you the story here. Uh, as to why this is, and again, for, for those who don't know, like, why was this titled Murphy versus Krugman? It's, it's more than simply, oh, because Bob doesn't like that guy. There's, a, there's more to the story, although that is true. So uh, this, was in the, this was a caricature in The Economist that was developed. It was talking about, like, the relationship of mainstream economics and the heterodox challengers, and this is one of the uh, things they had. So, so just to be clear, this is the only time I've ever been in The Economist magazine thus far in my career, so... <laughs> The, the, the back story of this, so don't do it right now, but at some point, if you haven't seen it, 
you and 25,000 other people have enjoyed this, this video, Stoke the Fear, uh, that I made. The, the background to this, it's a, it's a, I'll, I'll condense the story for you, but you, you, I don't want to leave you guys in the, in the dust. And if I'm going to show this picture, you got to know what the heck generated this. Uh, what happened was I, got, I was writing for Mises.org articles criticizing Paul Krugman a lot about his, his macro policies and things like this nature. And then this girl emails me and says, hey, I was just at a Barnes & Noble or something where Krugman had a new book coming out. I think it might have been his end this depression now, but I, I can't remember. Like I've had to look at the timeline to see to be able to place it. But he had some pop book that was coming out and he was doing the book tour and you know going and doing signings and so on. And there was a Q&A session. And so she was a fan of the Austrian school and so said, hey, Dr. Krugman, this is great stuff, but would you debate someone from the Austrian school about Austrian versus you know, Keynesian macroeconomics when it comes to business cycles and why do we have the housing bust and so forth? And, he, and she was telling me, he said something like, I know this is going to sound elitist and I'm, not, and I'm dodging the question, but it's not worth it. No serious economist takes the Austrians for real, and I would just be giving them a platform for no reason. So no, I'm not going to debate them. Right. So he said that publicly to her, and she was letting me know. And so that I started thinking, okay, how can I, you know, get him to debate an Austrian? And I went and saw that, um, the, the Facebook movie and, you know, I was like, yeah, we need a, like a big thing like that. And it, it was getting me to, to think along those lines. And so I came up with the idea. Do you remember those, I forget the name of it, but those animation, um, you, you could make like animated figures talk to each other. What, what, does someone remember what the name of that was? There's like eight things you guys have said. And none of those are the ones I'm looking for. Okay. Well, it's, it's something that was not what they just all yelled out. But anyway, it was like, hello, Jill, would you like to go to the movie with me? And she's like, no, I would not. I'm busy that night. And they, like, you would just talk like that. Okay. That wasn't like a reenactment from my high school days. But that was, um, so what, I, I made a thing and I, I had a, a debate challenge to Krugman. And the, the thing that made it unique, if you will, was there was a special platform for uh, funding things where you had a lot of distributed uh, support for it. And you could make conditional pledges, right? So it wasn't just saying, hey, I'm raising money to do some project, but it was if a sufficient number hit it, then it would, it would, it would kick in, right? And so this was like the parent site, and there were some spinoffs that were more commercial, like for restaurant promotions and stuff. But this was like the original <laughs> website that had this idea. And so that was the platform I set it up on. So it was like a no commitment, but the higher... So the, the deal was the way it was structured is if Paul Krugman ever agreed to debate me, then the pot of money that had accrued to that point would get donated to a New York City food bank. Okay. And so that was the, the leverage, if you will. So it's, Hey, it's not, you know, it's for charity and it's a New York City food bank. If Paul Krugman would debate me. And so then this just started, you know, I set up a website, Krugman debate, whatever. And I started making these goofy videos to promote it. So anyway, this was one of the, the first ones where I'm training and I, and I had my shirt off and, and so forth and I'm showing the guns and, uh, <laughs> And so, and so anyway, it got up to be over $100,000 was pledged, you know, so you people would put in their credit card information, but your credit card wouldn't get dinged until Paul Krugman agreed to debate me and that clause got satisfied. And so it was what I was thought was going to happen was that like progressives would say, Paul, just destroy this guy and get $100,000 to go to the food bank. But that's I didn't see ever a single progressive say to him, why don't you just wipe the floor with this guy? Instead, it was all, oh, this is blackmail. You know, like I was... You know, the kids were about to eat, and I was like, no, you don't. Not until. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, so I had, you know, all these, these videos and motion. Like, I was friends with uh, Glenn Jacobs, you know, and I was wondering, could I get him to do, like, a Rocky thing where he's, you know, Hulk Hogan and picking me up and throwing me and stuff. You know, I, had, I, was, I was worried Krug might agree to debate me before we unrolled all these videos that I had in mind. Uh, fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, so, but what ended up, people asked me, like, what happened to this thing? So one thing is that... Um, Krugman did officially say he wasn't going to, so I don't, it says, look up, move Paul's book, Bob Murphy on YouTube for his response. All right. So if you go to YouTube and just, the, the title of the video is move Paul's book is his official response. What happened is he was promoting a different book. Um, he guys sells a lot of books. You gotta give him that. He was on a, like a, a talking, a talk show radio program and somebody called in and I don't know if the guy like ambushed him, like told the call screener one thing, or if the call screener thought this, hey, this will be fun. Let's go ahead. instead of asking, you know, some question about GDP. This will be this will be more interesting for people driving around listening. But in any event, this guy called it and he 
And he goes, yeah, Dr. Krugman, uh, there's the, uh, the Austrian School of Economics, and they've, you know, they've made some good predictions and so on. And I, I think uh, there's this guy, Bob Murphy, who's got this debate challenge, and I'm wondering, what, you know, why aren't you debating him? And so Krugman's on, the, he's on a live call-in show, and they had the call screener let this guy through. He's probably a closet Austrian. And, uh, and so Krugman goes, this is, this is a serious policy debate. This is not going to be settled by who has the quickest sound bite. And we, you know, so like he's saying, I'm just the, the clown, and, and he's not going to... Uh, debate me. So that that was the official thing. The other part was just two reasons for why I kind of let this die away was, well, the third one is that now Tom and I have a podcast, so that's a better vehicle. But the other thing was that it, um, the the person I had contacted, the head of the food bank, just to make sure, like the philanthropy guy, the, you know, people to raise his funds for, just to make sure they were okay with it. It wasn't unseemly or anything. And that if the check did come through, they would be fine with it. And I told him, and he said, yeah, that, that's fine. Like, we have bar crawls, and we have all sorts of things that people do in the community. You know, he, he was going to take money. He wasn't going to refuse the check. But then his that guy left, and some other guy was there, and I was emailing him, and he, he wasn't returning my emails. Like, I was just making sure, are you still okay with this? So either he was busy or he was a Keynesian. Uh, so that was that. And then – and the other thing, too, just there's a fine line between being funny and using a food bank as the vehicle and, like, I don't know, making fun of people who, who are hungry. So I, I felt like I'm, I'm getting close to being a jerk, so I backed off on that one. So the moral of the story is if you want to boost your career, I'm not saying it's for everybody, but if you do a topless scene, sometimes things happen. So <laughs> it's true in economics. It's true elsewhere. Okay, let me uh, talk a little bit about economics. That's probably why you're here. So I'm going to go through some of the issues that Krugman... Um, talks about in his column, and then to give you sort of the Austrian response on this. So one thing is Brexit. Now here, his position has been a little bit nuanced, and we'll talk about that. But he did uh, start out, so he agreed with the, the common view that Brexit is going to make the British people poorer. And so let's make sure you understand the, the mechanism by that. He, he was saying it was going to be about 2% perpetual reduction in income. All right, And he was saying, though, just to, to be fair, he was not thinking it was going to be catastrophic. He was so he's saying, yeah, that's a big hit. A lot of things would not be that big of a, a deal, and, and that's pretty uh, significant. But he was saying that that's not, in the grand scheme, you know, that, that huge thing. But it will make them poorer. And Tom and I took, took that issue on in, our, in the podcast. And so let me just make sure you understand the, the argument here, because I think it's important. Rather, a lot of people, a lot of uh, like free market types and pro-secession people who are against large centralized governments, they were sort of taking that at face value. The, the argument that, oh, the British people are going to be poor because of this. But they're saying, hey, but, you know, money's not everything. And who, and who cares? This is, you know, for a matter of political sovereignty. But Tom and I were, were questioning this. So uh, the first of all, just think through the logic of it. Why would it be the case that Brexit would make the British people poorer it would have to be because they're going to lose access now to European markets. And that was the analysis Krugman was relying on. He was doing back of the envelope calculations to talk about tariff rates in general being higher, how much of British trade, like pre-entering the EU and then post and so forth. That, that was the arguments he was going through to try to see how much of an effect would this have. And so Tom and I pointed out that, okay, so you're, you're admitting then that by being in the EU – that means you have tariff barriers against outsiders, right? Because if, if that weren't the case, if being in the EU allowed you to trade with the rest of the world freely, then whether you were in or out, that wouldn't affect you, right? So if the, if the argument for remaining in, in terms of helping your people, in terms of their just standard prosperity, is that you have access to the EU markets, then that clearly means the people in the EU are not trading freely with the rest of the world. So there was that element to, be, to just say for it, that now at least the people in Great Britain have the ability to have unilateral trade deals with other countries around the world. So on net, even taking this as a given, it's not clear w which way that cuts. It's possible that by having the freedom to contract with other uh, countries and have one-off trade deals with them, the, great, the people in Great Britain are going to have more uh, free trade on net. But the other issue is and just why someone might, if you were for free trade, you might favor secession is a more general principle and not just on this one particular issue because the the larger context here is people were saying well, it's not just if great britain does it what if other countries start one by one you know germany says you know we're sick of of carrying this team and we're going to just go off and have our own thing and not have these freeloading countries draining us and so on if countries just all start breaking apart that's the thing people are really worried about 
And so Tom and I pointed out that in, if what the specific concern is, is tariff barriers and free and open trade, then the more secession there is, you would think other things equal, that would make a stronger argument for lower tariff barriers in general. And so just think through the logic of it. In the United States, for example, it, it's possible you could have free trade within the United States, but have a, a high tariff barrier, you know, in terms of vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, right? That has happened historically, and the people who are against free trade often point to the U.S. example as showing, see, you can have a strong uh, industrialized economy uh, getting richer, even with high tariff barriers, okay? So if you're against tariffs, you would say that was in spite of them and so on. But clearly, it's possible for that to happen. Your country doesn't plunge into utter chaos if you have high tariffs, if you have a big country. Because what happens is the domestic free trade allows for the division of labor internally. But it would be crazy for like an individual city to say, we're going to have free trade domestically, but we're going to have a high tariff barrier against the rest of the world, right? If it's just a city of a million people, all right? And even more so like an individual household, that would be really insane. If one household had a tariff barrier against the rest of the world, they would starve to death, right? You're growing your own food, making your own clothes and so on. So the the point we were saying is if secession became more widespread, then these countries, they couldn't, they wouldn't have the luxury of having high tariff barriers against the rest of the world. They would have to lower their tariff barriers. And also the smaller the jurisdictions, the more there's free mobility, um, just in terms of competition, right? That you, if you have a smaller jurisdiction, people have more exit options and that tends to keep the level of government manageable. So just as an aside, I mean, that's one of the arguments historians make for why did what we call political liberty, why did that originate in what you would th think of as Western Europe and not like in China or Africa? And one of the conventional explanations that has to do with geography and things of that nature, but just for various reasons, it wasn't planned. It was like a spontaneous order that people, no sovereign had control over a wide expanse of territory. There was a lot of splintered jurisdictions. And so then competition among them the, the nobles and you know they they stood up for their rights, the Magna Carta and all that stuff, and so they, it was because of those reasons that political liberty as we know it sort of developed accidentally. All right, so again, saying I, we we challenge Krugman's views on this, thinking that it's it's not correct that that would be permanently poor. Okay, another aspect now, and this is what I'm going to talk. What I mentioned earlier, this is one example. I think I'm going to have another one in the talk about how Krugman makes some assumptions for one argument where it, it, it buttresses the conclusion he wants, but then next week when he needs the assumptions to go the other way, he flips them. So let me explain it in context of Brexit and then relate it to an earlier column. So with Brexit, Krugman had, had stuck his neck out saying, yes, this is going to make them poorer, the, the British people, if they do this, but my colleagues who are predicting bloody disaster, they're overshooting, you know, they're, they're exaggerating. It's not going to be that bad and, or at least I haven't seen anybody convince me why it would be so bad. Right? So I, I'm agreeing with Krugman in that respect, that he, he often does try to be nuanced. I, I will give him that uh, credit. And so he said, OK, what I'm seeing now is once the stock market kind of recovered after the Brexit vote, Krugman's thinking, I told you guys. And then a lot of his colleagues were saying the way that the mechanism by which Brexit is going to cause really a really bad economy beyond just tariff barriers being slightly higher is that it causes uncertainty, right? Everybody freezes up because they don't know what's coming, right? The, the vote's uncertain. It's not even clear if they actually are going to leave the EU now that people are reconsidering and seeing the logistical nightmares involved. And so Krugman says, okay, but think through. Like, no one's shown me a model. Why, why would uncertainty per se cause long -term, uh, a long-term reduction in economic growth? He's saying, and he walked through an example. He says, yeah, say some guy wants to open a shopping mall in this district that's heavily dependent on tourism. And it, you're forecasting and saying, if Britain stays in, then that flow is there and you want to invest in the mall. But if not, you know, if, if, if you knew they were leaving, then they wouldn't invest there. And he's saying, what that uncertainty, how, how is that making us poorer than we otherwise would be relative to if we knew what was going to happen? Okay, so he's saying, yes, you're going to be poor if they don't make that investment because of the, the Brexit vote, but it's not like over and above because of the uncertainty, because his point was eventually you'll know what's going to happen, right? If, if it's another 18 months, then that just means, okay, instead of investing in a smooth flow for a while, 
will happen is there'll be a drop in investment. Then when the uncertainty gets resolved, there'll be a big spike. But he was saying over the long term, it's just changing the timing of the investment. All right. So you guys, you get, you get his point. So he's saying, yeah, right now, investment might be lower than it otherwise would have been because of this uncertainty. But five years from now, looking backwards, it's not like aggregate investment in GDP is going to be lower than it otherwise would have been. It's just going to be lumpier. It would have pushed it forward a little bit until we wait to see exactly what the situation is. All right. So that was his argument. And that's I actually kind of agree with that. Right. That's that's good. The problem is he made the exact opposite argument like two or three weeks earlier where the context was there was I, I forget I can I would have to look it up if you guys want if you want to see the thing I can get it for you after the talk. But one of the Fed uh, governors or somebody was talking about low interest rates and saying, you know, we, we don't think that another rate cut or like negative interest rates is really on the margin going to stimulate the economy very much. And he said, because all it would really do is pull investment projects forward. All right, so you, you guys, so again, so Krugman's quoting someone who's critiquing the standard Keynesian view, which says we need to goose spending. Interest rates now are still too high. And so we got to push them down to be even lower. By the way, just as a general remark, it's amazing to me that they push interest rates down to 0% and they still say, well, it's not enough, right? So it's it's amazing that how how far, and they just keep saying, well, no, clearly it's not enough that what would the world need to look like for them to say, maybe this isn't working. But back to this particular controversy, so the, the critic of Keynesian economics was saying, it's not clear to me why pushing interest rates down another 25 basis points is going to really do anything. If somebody makes an investment because they go down a little bit, really, isn't that just going to be that they're building the factory now because of the, you know, the, the bargain on interest rates instead of when they would have built it 18 months from now? And so it's not going to, over a five-year span, cause more total investment spending. It's just going to pull it forward a little bit. And Krugman was scratching his head at that saying, I can't even come up with a model where that would be true. All right? he, the, so he's saying the critic is wrong. Of course, if, we, if it boosts spending now, it's going to have a permanent effect. So it's, I suppose you could say in the two-week span, Krugman all of a sudden became more creative. You know, he could come up with the model. But I think more the, the better explanation, and again, there's lots of examples like this, is where Krugman always ends up with the argument for the Keynesian policy prescription, but he changes the assumptions to get the result that he wants. Okay, let me talk a little bit about this issue of predictions and economics. So if you have been reading Krugman, uh, you know that he's he's made a big deal of this. All right, so I, it might be hard for you in the back to see this, but he says uh, at the bottom here, the truth is that basic macroeconomics, ISLM type macro, the stuff that's in Econ 101 textbooks, has performed spectacularly well in this crisis. All right, so this is a running theme with Krugman that uh, his models predict better, right? That they make forecasts about what's going to happen with GDP, inflation, interest rates, and that people who were warning against this stuff made their own set of predictions, and the Keynesian predictions were right, and the other predictions were wrong. And so therefore, Keynesian economics is, is more scientific, and the people clinging to these other views are clearly unscientific and ideo ideologues, right? Because they refuse to, to move in the, in the face of evidence against their favor. Okay, so let me First, just explain the standard Austrian view. On, you know, how, how does this relate? How do you do science in economics? So, praxeology and predict, prediction. Praxeology, of course, is the, the logic of action. I know some of this is review, but th this is a, a subtle point, and maybe I probably will say it in different words than what you would have heard earlier in the week. So, yes, Mises definitely thought economics was a science, right? But its method was different from those in the natural sciences. Okay, so what happens is in economics in particular, they think the physicists are really smart and they want to be like the physicists. Okay, they have there's a term like physics envy to make fun of economists who have this perspective, and uh, and so they wanted to model Paul Samuelson. If you know that name, was one who really took economics in that direction. So that if you looked at journal articles they all became pr mathematical proofs in, in, in economics journal articles. So Mises thought that was a mistake, that a better, so this is me talking, not Mises necessarily, but what I'm saying is, if you wanna think of an analogy, a better one is something like geometry. Okay, so in physics, 
yeah, we don't really know anything about how an electron feels. Okay, we don't know what it's like to be an electron. Right? At least I don't. Maybe some of you do. Right? But you don't know what it's like to be an electron. And so really all you can do when it comes to different models of nature is make predictions about observations you're going to make. That's really the criterion for what's a better theory than another one. Whereas in economics, we do have some insight. We know what it's like to you know, have preferences and to have a, a, a rational plan to achieve some goal, to engage in action. And so you can start from that premise. Now, again, if you want to, like I say, use an analogy, start, starting from the action axiom, you logically deduce things about action per se. And so if that sounds weird to you and sounds unscientific or unrigorous, just use geometry as an analogy. In geometry, you do something very similar. You start with axioms and you logically deduce propositions about that and you don't go out and test them, right? So if, if your teacher teaches you the Pythagorean theorem, that's something, if you grasp the, the truth of that, you have it, right? You know what that is and you wouldn't say, well, let me go test, let me go get a thousand triangles and measure them and see in what percentage, you know, does this hold true? And it's either 100% or if it doesn't, I'm going to think maybe I measured wrong and keep rechecking it. If, if that's what you were doing, you would be missing the point. You wouldn't get what it means to prove something in math, all right? So certainly you can illustrate it, and if you're going to teach kids the Pythagorean theorem, you would do well to actually draw a triangle rather than just, you know, teaching it to them some abstract language that you wouldn't want to show it to them. But again, the, the proof of the Pythagorean theorem is not something you do empirically, right? That would be missing the point. It would be very misleading if you, went, if you allowed people to do that. Again, it would just be to apply it to maybe get them to understand what it's saying, to let them play with real-world triangles, but that's not the way you would prove it. Um, but even having said that, though, does that mean that, that I just show you that geometry really is just a bunch of word games, right? Because that's something critics of Misesian praxeology say, once they, they hear Mises talk about this is the way economic science should be built up, they say, okay, well then you're really just going around in a circle. If you, if everything in your conclusions is coming from your initial assumptions, you put everything in, in the beginning. It's like, that's where the rabbit got in the hat. And so we don't learn anything about the outside world. It just was all in our head originally. And that may sound compelling to you if you're thinking of physics and chemistry, that, you know, if you had physicists arguing about something and they refuse to actually go look at a microscope or go look at a telescope to settle the matter, they would be ridiculous. You know, that, that would be a silly way of proceeding. But in geometry, that wouldn't be a silly way of proceeding, right? That's exactly how you would do it. And notice, we think it's very useful to teach geometry, that people who build bridges and so on they need to have that as a background foundation. And we can argue about why is that? And, and philosophers and mathematicians do argue about that stuff. Like if we were in a different type of universe, would it be a waste of time to study geometry or would we study non-Euclidean and blah, blah, blah. But clearly in the real world right now, it is undeniably true that we still teach geometry this way from axiomatic foundations, logical deductions, and that we are gaining something important about the real world. To, to motivate that, if like Martians showed up, there's a sense in which if they said to us, hey, we don't, what, this word bachelor, what is that? We, we're unfamiliar with that. And they said, oh, it's an unmarried male. There's a sense in which we would really just be giving them information about our conventions. You, you see what I mean? That it's not like they could go back to their home planet and share that information. And they said, oh, thank goodness. Now we know what bachelor means. That explains everything. Well, if they were watching TV shows, that, that might explain that one. Right. But you get the point that there we would merely be giving them a definition. It would just be kind of giving them trivia about us. Whereas if they showed up and they didn't have the Pythagorean theorem, like if they're just mathematicians hadn't stumbled upon that in the centuries of Martian existence to that point, and one of our people taught it to them, and then they went back to their home planet and taught it to all their you know, little Martian kids or whatever, then they really would have gained knowledge about reality. You, you, so you see the, the distinction there. And so by the same token, if you taught them the proposition that other things equal increasing the quantity of money reduces the purchasing power of money or makes prices in general rise, you have taught them something about reality, even though that's a non-falsifiable proposition. Even if in reality, the quantity of money goes way up and prices don't go way up, that didn't just refute that proposition. It's, oh, other things aren't equal. The demand to hold money went up for some reason. All right. And that's 
So you, again, you see that there's a, you're telling something about reality by teaching economic science, but the way you learn those propositions and convey them to others is not the way you do things in, in science. It's not the scientific method the way you probably learned in school, where you, know, you, know, you have a bunch of data, you form a hypothesis, you derive uh, a falsifiable prediction from your hypothesis, and then you go get new data and, and check it. That, you know, that's, sort of, that's not even really true a lot in the natural sciences, but it's certainly not true, Mises would say, the way economics should proceed. Let me say one thing about this to really, because I think this point is, is critical, and this is one of the things where a lot of mainstream economists hit Austrians on, is this, this point. If you believe in free trade, how did you come to that conclusion? Was it because you were looking at regressions and you saw... You know, these, this country had high tariff barriers, it reduced them, and then I looked at four quarters out and what was the T-test and so on. It was probably like you read Bastiat's satire about the petition of the candle makers, or you, you know, read some thought experiment that David Friedman came up with, and you just saw it and went, oh, of course, right? And so what we do in terms of standard economic theory is things like that, where you just see it from a certain angle and it's obvious what the principle involved is. And then, yeah, you got to have judgment to apply it in the real world. But the principles themselves, economic law, is something you th get through introspection. Now, having said all that, don't take away that Mises was anti-empirical. He, he wasn't. He and Hayek like, founded a, a, biz, a, psych, a center to study business cycles, right? So that was clearly empirically motivated, right? So again, I'd, we stress this point, and then sometimes people think we're saying, don't ever look at statistics, that that's not the issue. The point is, though, the theory you have to go parse history and to look at the data, you need to have a, a basic theory beforehand. Okay, let me return now to specific things that Krugman said. So it's interesting that he himself picked the criterion of success in you know, the predictions your model makes in order to you know, judge the efficacy of a theory because he has a couple of doozies. I'll give you a couple of them in this, in this talk. So the story here, oops, sorry about that. That's on my computer, it looked fine. The, the growth was up there. So this says during uh, what was called the fiscal doomsday machine of the budget sequester. So if you remember, if you're not familiar with US politics, there was a debate over the budget deal and of raising the debt ceiling. And then the Republicans slipped in this thing that was called a sequester that involved a combination of spending reductions and tax hikes in order to reduce the deficit. And so this kicked in in early 2013, and Krugman called it, quote, one of the worst policy decisions in U.S. history. All right, so he wasn't pulling any punches. He called it a fiscal doomsday machine. So as of April 2013, this is now, to get your timeline right, so the Congress is raising taxes, cutting spending, so those are you know, austerity measures from the Keynesian point of view. But the Fed at the time was expanding again. It was more QE, all right? And so Krugman was saying, we're going to get a good test now of Keynesian versus market monetarist views. So here, you need to know the background. The market monetarists, I'm, I'm curious, how, how many people know what that means? Okay. So uh, the market monetarists, they're based on... Milton Friedman's monetarism, they're modern day, they're, they're free market in general, but they're, I would say, not free market when it comes to, they think the Federal Reserve has an important role to play in managing the money supply. And in particular, uh, guys like Scott Sumner, who's one of the leading market monetarists, says that the Fed has been very tight since 2008. And so he says, that's the problem. That's what's been causing the slow growth. So the market monetarists were saying, don't worry about the budget sequester because the Fed is going to inflate, that will offset it. They'll maintain aggregate demand. And Krugman was saying in April 2013, we're getting a good test of the Keynesian versus market monetarist views, and it's not looking good for them. Because as of that point, economic growth in 2013 was pretty sluggish. Okay, so then what happened was the rest of 2013 actually turned out surprisingly well. And let me just note something, I don't have it in terms of the slides, but just to make sure you get the big picture. Do you guys, how familiar are you with the fact that when Obama came in, the um, his, his team was led up by Christina Romer and they wanted to push through the uh, stimulus package. And they were ahead of this famous chart and predictions about the fact that if we do nothing, unemployment's going to go up to a certain amount. And that was supposed to be catastrophic and that's un unacceptable. If we have the Obama stimulus package, 
will limit the rise in unemployment. So they passed the stimulus. Unemployment in, in practice went up higher than they were warning would happen if they did nothing, right? So I want get what happened. And so you would think, surely that's a feather in our cap as free market economists, right? And of course not. The Keynesians just said, it's a good thing we passed that Obama stimulus because the economy was in worse shape than we realized, right? Does everyone get how, how they dealt with that? Okay. The opposite happened when it came to the sequester. So leading up to when they were going to have these tax hikes and spending cuts, so from a Keynesian point of view, that's the last thing in the world you want to do when there's a weak economy, right, because it reduces aggregate demand. And so there were Keynesian forecasts that were predicting what would happen with and without the budget sequester to get a sense of on the margin how big of a deal is this going to be. And so they had unemployment and GDP forecasts saying if Congress goes ahead and foolishly implements this sequester, you know, unemployment will do, do such and such, GDP will do such and such. If they don't, you know, if they avoid this insanity, this will be the baseline. And it was the mirror image where they did the sequester, the thing the Keynesians said don't do, and the economy did better than the Keynesian forecast said would happen if they didn't do the sequester, okay? So it was like the, fl the flip. And there, again, they didn't talk about that too much because it wasn't like such a big, like, people weren't calling them on it because it wasn't as prominent as the Obama stimulus package. But again, there, the, the argument would have to be, uh, oh, thank goodness, the economy was in a lot stronger shape so that when they hit us with this sequester, we were able to weather the blow more than we previously realized. All right, so again, it's the exact way the world would look if the Austrians were correct, but the Keynesians can always just say, well, you know, counterfactuals, you, you know, you, you, can, you can prove anything you want. Okay, so back to this particular controversy with Krugman, he was, again, in the early 2013, when things looked bad for the economy, was running victory laps saying, oh, this is a good test of our views versus the market monetarists, and it's not looking good for them. And I'm, I'm not paraphrasing. He, he literally said it's not looking good. You know, he, and then by 20, January 2014, the economy had turned around, outperforming what the people were forecasting. And so at that point, you can imagine some market monetarists were saying, hey, I think this shows that we were right, that the Fed offset the budget austerity, right? And that their, their QE was able to offset and keep aggregate demand up there. And Krugman wrote a column with no sense of irony saying, and then you've got these market monitors somehow claiming that 2013 was a test of these two views when clearly they should know no one country's experience can test two rival macro theories. All right. So do you get what I'm saying? He was saying this is a good test and running victory laps when he thought he was going to win. Then when he lost, he said, I can't believe these fools think this is a good test. All right. I'm not, I'm not, you might think, oh, come on, you're probably exaggerating for it. To, no, I'm not. That's exactly the way it happened. Okay. Then the story gets even better. So remember that was from April, 2013 to 2014. Time passes. People forget that Krugman, you know, had been saying how bad 2013 was going to be as a, as a demonstration that his view was right. By the end of 2014, the economy was doing a lot better than people had thought. And so at this point, what do you think Krugman said? So, you know what? I've been wrong for a while. Maybe I'm just going to stop and think about what I did in the corner. That's not what he did. Instead, he's running victory laps saying the Obama boom shows these conservative critics of Obamacare are crazy. They were warning us that Obamacare was going to cripple the economy, cause all these job losses. They were wrong, and yet these clowns continue to hold their outdated right-wing views, even though the data shows their forecasts were wrong. So you, you see what he did there? So again, it's if the economy is bad, it proves that they needed more stimulus, just like Krugman has been warning. If the economy is good, it proves that the critics of Obamacare were wrong, just like Krugman predicted. You see how that works? So it's heads, Keynes wins, tails, Hayek loses. Okay. Let me spend a little bit, and then I'll, I do want to take some of your questions. Let me just run through. It would be dishonest of me to talk about this and not bring up the awkward fact. In case you don't know, I foolishly made a $500 bet. There's this guy, David R. Henderson. He blogs at EconLog. Brian Kaplan had made a bet with me about inflation because I was concerned about you know, what Bernanke was doing. I thought CPI inflation was going to be high. Brian Kaplan said to me, you want to bet on it? And I said, okay. David Henderson also thought I was wrong, and he got me to bet for $500. I lost that bet, all right? And then I think Brad DeLong, like, put it on his calendar or something, because right when it happened, he blogged about it. 
And so Krugman and DeLong were mentioning me by name and saying, see, these crazy Austrian ideologues, they lose a bet about inflation. They were totally wrong, and yet they cling to their model. So I know this sounds... So, so for one thing, you know, what did you learn? Did you guys, you know, this Family Guy clip? Do you guys know Family Guy? So this, what happened here was they're at a baseball game, and this kid catches the ball, and, uh, or, or, sorry, Stewie has the ball, and this kid had a bat, and Stewie says, I say, can I trade you my bat for your ball? And he goes, okay, and then gets it, and then Stewie smacks him in the face of the bat and takes the ball and says, what did you learn? <laughs> okay, so what, what did I learn about here is you, you want to be careful shooting your mouth off and doing things if, if you're known as a representative of Austrian economics. Because what was happening is I was making a bet with my own judgment, having written several things about why Austrian economics doesn't make formal predictions and so on. All the stuff I just went through with you guys about its logical deductions. And so, but it was awkward. It was a, it was a PR awkwardness, right? <laughs> and so anyway, it was, it was bad. It never even occurred to me that if I lost that bet, then people were going to say, oh, see, Austrian economics is wrong. So that's what I'm saying was the, the foolishness of it that I thought I was making a bet with David. But what's particularly interesting about this, it's not like David Henderson was a Keynesian. He also was for austerity. He had written studies for, I think, Mercatus about the Canadian experience of, of cutting their budget and being pro-austerity. And so it was like two free market economists who were against Keynesianism made a bet with each other and one won and one lost, and then Krugman was saying, see, the free market guy lost, so therefore, so I was, I've been trying to come up with an analogy for that, but nothing really does it justice, so if you guys have one, let me know. Just to round out this discussion, what's pretty funny is Krugman uh, also has made bad inflation predictions, right? So it's, it might sound like I'm saying, okay, yeah, I got that one wrong, but in the grand scheme, but no, Krugman was also wrong about inflation himself the other way. So he says here, that there's an ongoing process of disinflation that could, in the not too long, lead to outright deflation. Japan, here we come. So he wrote that in 2010, looking at this, these particular measures of inflation. So you see it went up and then it plummeted right you know, after the, the, the crisis. And so Krugman, in early 2010, was saying these measures of price inflation might go negative. Okay, so he was warning about outright deflation at that point. And this is how things turned out. So I'm using here the same measures he was using. At this point, right when that came down, he was warning that it was going to keep going and go negative. And just a few months after he wrote that, you see how much they went up. Okay, so it's not like he hit that one out of the park. Okay, then you say, okay, so he was warning about deflation, but you were warning about inflation, trying to scare people. So yours was the more egregious error. It would be convenient if Paul Krugman ever hysterically warned about big inflation, wouldn't it? Fortunately, he did. So this was uh, a memo, September 1982. Paul Krugman and Larry Summers were in the Council of Economic Advisors writing this to uh, Martin Feldstein. And they were warning at that time that, I, I realize it's hard to read, they were saying that as real interest rates decline and the economy recovers, expect the real exchange rate and real commodity prices to return to historical levels. We'll add five percentage points to future increases in the consumer price index increase. Right. So as of... 1982, remember, there had been the high inflation in the late 70s. There was that recession, inflation, price inflation, I'm talking about, rates came down. And so Krugman, in 1982, September 82, is warning, once the economy gets through this bad recession and goes back to normal growth, we think price inflation is going to rise five percentage points. And so you can see that's the point at which they made that prediction. All right, And so right then, CPI was running about 5%. It was like 4.9 at that point. So if it went up to five percentage points more, that would be a 10% CPI increase. So ironically, in 1982, Krugman made just about literally the same prediction that I ended up making. And it wasn't that Paul Krugman was an Austrian in 1982, and then because of this humbling experience, became a Keynesian. It's that he was you know, still a Keynesian at that time. Okay, let me, uh, we just probably have time for a couple more, a couple questions just to round out this discussion. Any any questions? Yeah. There's any, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of other people outside of Austria position that sees the that work that Krugman does. Like, we aren't, there's got to be other people criticizing his content that quick, right? Or is it? Yeah, I th so the question is, do other people notice the apparent uh, backtracking and, and flip-flopping? 
I don't know because it's to catch that stuff. I mean, he is very precise. And so, like I said, no one thing that he writes is all that controversial. Like he makes a bunch of assumptions and spins out the, the thing. So you would kind of have to really be a religious reader of Krugman and have a really good memory. And so I'm blessed with having a good memory and I'm cursed with it. I'm a religious reader of Paul Krugman. So it, the, the thing that people dislike about Krugman is he makes it so personal. Like he literally, if you, if you guys don't know, I mean, the part of the reason people like the podcast, I go to conferences around the world. People come up to me and the first thing they say is, yeah, we hate Krugman too, right? It is amazing. He's like the leading anti-export of the United States. Um, and, and so that's the thing. He, he literally calls his critics knaves and fools, right? That if, if you, he has a column entitled knaves and fools, right? Saying that they're, you know, they're evil, either evil or uh, foolish. Do you have time for maybe one more? Yep. Okay, so yeah, real quickly, uh, I know we're out of time. So the question is, why couldn't the Fed just indefinitely keep interest rates low? I think they could so long as conventional measures of price inflation don't blow up. Like that's really the thing that would ultimately make them in a typical boom-bust cycle. You know, there's easy money, easy money, low, artificially low interest rates. Usually the thing that makes the Fed or the, or the commercial banks back off that is they see rising measures of consumer price inflation. So this, it hasn't happened this time, and there's various reasons for why that might not be. Having said all that, even a lot of, I think, Fed officials, they know that this this is not sustainable. And they're coming up with, you know, trying to explain, saying, well, look at asset prices. And so it's ironic. I think a lot of Fed officials are halfway decent economists, and they know that what we did, yeah, it was necessary to get through that crisis in their minds, but we can't just keep doing this forever, even if the standard metrics we use, like unemployment and, and uh, price inflation, are not signaling you got to jack up rates right now. I think they realize we kind of have to ease back in. The last thing I'll say on that is Janet Yellen so far, just don't be thinking, oh, yeah, Janet Yellen's this crazy money printer. She oversaw what was called the taper. And since uh, like October 2014, the Fed's balance sheet has been roughly stable. They've just been rolling over assets as they mature and holding a constant balance sheet. So in terms of high level, like what's called the monetary base, the Fed actually has been holding pat for like a year and a half at this point. All right, so just make, make sure you really, and you can look at like measures of the dollar. The dollar strengthened sharply against other currencies in that period. So just, it's more nuanced. So if you want to talk about crazy inflation, it's, yeah, that's Bernanke, but Bernanke and Yellen have played different roles in this. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks.